Hello, and welcome to Elevator Pitch Series for the Radiographer. I am Michael, and this is the first video in the series on radiographic equipment. We'll be kicking off the equipment series by looking at the concept of electricity. We'll be finding out how it is important in radiography. We'll also be learning about the types of current, transformers and rectifiers. A quick question. What do light bulbs, digital cameras, mobile phones and microphones have in common? They all need electricity to work. Electricity is basically the flow of electrons. This flow of electrons produces a form of energy, electrical energy. The X-ray tube is another device that needs energy from this flow of electrons. Electricity is needed in an X-ray tube to cause electrons to be released from the cathode of the X-ray tube and to drive these released electrons to the anode of the X-ray tube for photon production. In the next couple of videos, you will learn why these processes are important to radiography. Electricity can flow in two forms, as a direct current or as an alternating current. In direct current, electricity flows in just one direction, it is unidirectional. When it reaches its peak, it does not go to the negative direction. You would see that on the diagram the wave representing direct current stays above the line, on the positive side. Devices like our mobile phones use electricity in this form. The alternating current is the exact opposite. It changes in direction when it reaches its peak. On the diagram, you'll observe the wave representing alternating current moving below the line to the negative side after the peak has been reached. It then goes from negative to positive after the negative peak has been reached. It continues in this manner. This is the form of electricity that is supplied from our national grid systems. So how exactly do we generate electricity? At this point, I should point out that electricity is usually generated as an alternating current. To obtain direct current, the steps in producing alternating current are modified. Now, generation of electricity is based on Faraday's first law of electromagnetic induction, which states that, when a conductor is placed in a changing magnetic field, an electromotive force is induced, and if the conductor circuit is closed, current is also induced. As we go through the steps of generating electric current, this law begins to make a bit more sense. In this diagram, the red and blue lines represent the conductor wires. These conductors are placed between the north and south pole of a magnet, that is, within a magnetic field. The conductors are also connected to devices known as slip rings. Meanwhile, the slip rings are connected to carbon brushes. I hope you can observe all these on the diagram. The carbon brushes are connected to the circuit where we want generated electricity to flow into. Now that we have gone over the schematics, let us go through the steps involved in alternating current generation. First, natural sources of energy such as force from flowing water in a dam or wind energy is used to make the loop of conductor wires to rotate. Even though the magnetic poles are not moving, rotation of the conductor wire causes the magnetic field around the conductor to change, a changing magnetic field is produced. That takes us back to the law, because the conductor wires are now in a changing magnetic field, and this circuit is closed, EMF and current are induced. The induced current is collected by the metal or carbon brushes, and transferred into the circuit which we want to supply with electricity. This current is alternating because the wires keep rotating, and as they do so, their direction of flow changes from positive to negative, back to positive and continuously in that sequence. Thus, the electricity flows in two directions, alternating current. We have already stated that generation of direct current is a modification of generation of alternating current. Let us look at it in a bit more detail. The direct current generator still has the loop of conductor wires placed between two magnetic poles, like in alternating current generators. However, instead of two slip rings, one ring that has been split into two is used. This is known as a split ring. Each half of the split ring is connected to a metal or carbon brush, which connects to the circuit. The split ring and metal brushes are known combined as a split ring commutator. If you look up the meaning of a commutator at this point, it will help you to better understand what goes on in these steps and how it differs from alternating current generation. Let's dig deeper into the steps. Because a split ring is used, as rotation of the wires and ring occurs, each split ring touches a different metal brush during each half cycle of rotation. Thus, while the conductor wire continuously rotates and changes the direction of current from positive to negative, the split ring reverses this change in direction by touching different metal brushes. This causes electricity to flow in just one direction. A direct current. The waveform produced by a direct or alternating current has certain characteristics. Let us outline them. 
First is the cycle, it is the movement of the waveform from a zero point on the horizontal line to another zero point on the horizontal line. A cycle contains a positive half cycle and a negative half cycle. The period t is the length of time in seconds that it takes to complete one cycle. The frequency f is the number that can be completed in one second. It is measured in hertz. Now, f is the reciprocal of t meaning, to get f, you say 1 divided by t. This means that t is also the reciprocal of f, and so, to get t, you say 1 divided by f. Now, amplitude is the highest point in a cycle, it represents the maximum current or voltage produced in a cycle. Now let us look at very important devices called transformers. They are electromechanical devices that step up or step down voltages. They operate based on the principle of electromagnetic induction. Now how do transformers look? No, that's not the transformer we have in mind today. This is how an electromagnetic transformer looks. It performs its function through something known as mutual induction, in which a changing magnetic field in one coil induces or causes current to flow in a secondary coil that is near it. On this diagram, you can see that alternating current has been generated and flows in just one coil, the one on the left-hand side. You can also see another coil on the right-hand side. Current is not generated into this coil, but because it is placed close to the primary coil, mutual induction causes the current generated in the primary coil to also flow in the secondary coil. These coils we've been talking about, the primary and secondary, have a property known as turns. Turns is practically how many loops the coil has. It determines the function of the transformer. There are two popular configurations of a transformer. First is the step-up transformer. In this, the number of turns in the secondary coil is more than the number of turns in the primary coil. The second is the step-down transformer, and like you may have guessed, this is the opposite. The number of turns in the primary coil is more than the number in the secondary coil. An important property of a transformer is its turns ratio. This is the ratio of the number of turns in the primary coil to that in the secondary coil. It is useful because the turns ratio is also the ratio of voltage induced in the primary coil to that induced in the secondary coil. It is also the ratio of current induced in the secondary coil to that in primary coil. These equations help us to estimate one value when we know others. We must take note that the process of stepping current and voltages up or down in a transformer is not 100% efficient. Something called transformer losses is always encountered. The types of transformer losses include Copper losses which occur due to a resistance in the flow of electricity in the copper wires of the coil. When wires that have low resistivity are used, less copper losses occur. Another type of transformer loss is hysteresis. As current is induced in a transformer, a repeated magnetization and demagnetization of the core is experienced. This process causes a reduced efficiency. Lastly, we have eddy current losses which occur due to the buildup of small currents within the core of the transformer. If thin pieces of iron are placed between the sheets of the transformer core, these eddy currents are unable to be transmitted, and losses due to them are thus reduced. This method of reducing eddy current losses is called lamination. As we have stated earlier, electricity flowing from the national grid is usually an alternating current. However, most devices, including our X-ray tube, need direct current. A rectifier is a device that converts alternating current coming from the national grid to direct current needed by many devices. It is a diode made of a semiconductor like silicon or germanium, and it causes electricity to flow in only one direction, as direct current would. In X-ray machines, the rectifier is normally placed between the high-tension transformer and the X-ray tube. There are two types of rectification. First is the half-wave rectification. In this, when converting from alternating to direct current, only one half wave in each cycle is used. The half wave in the opposite direction is not used. In the diagram below, you would observe that when the waveform on the left-hand side is rectified by a half wave rectifier, only the current moving in the positive direction is used. The current moving in the opposite direction, represented by the half waves below the line, is discarded. The advantages of half-wave rectification are its ease of construction and the fact that it is less expensive to acquire. However, because only one half of each cycle is used, it is a wasteful and less efficient process of converting alternating current to direct. Also, half-wave rectifiers are less rugged, making them unsuitable for high output equipment. Next is full-wave rectification. In this, the current moving in the opposite direction is converted and made to move in the same direction with the other current. 
As you can see on the diagram, no half cycle is discarded, rather, the bidirectional current is made to move in one direction. This makes the rectifier much more efficient than a half-wave rectifier. Also, these types of rectifiers are less prone to damage and are thus usable with high output equipment. They are however more expensive to construct and acquire. Earlier in this video, we learned how a rotating loop of wire within a magnetic field causes a change in the magnetic field, which would go on to induce current, according to Faraday's first law of electromagnetic induction. But how do we determine how much current we are generating? Let us conclude by explaining this. The amount of current generated by this changing magnetic field is dependent on Faraday's second law of electromagnetic induction, which loosely states that the magnitude of electromotive force induced in the coil is equal to the rate of change of the magnetic flux. This means that how fast the loop of wire rotates determines how fast the magnetic field changes. And the faster the magnetic field changes, the more current generated. That concludes this video on electricity. We look forward to your questions and comments in the comments section or via email. If you love this video and would want more content, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Until next time, do enjoy the learning process and take care.